Hey, everybody, it's Breakaway Rail Talk time, episode number nine. And just like the previous eight, this breakaway episode is brought to you by Arian Pedigrees. That's Arian, A-R-I-O-N dot C-O dot N-Z, Australia and New Zealand's leading thoroughbred pedigree provider. I got to tell you, I use their pedigree reports all the time. Just use it when we bought the, the, the mayor sales topper at the last digital sale. I went ahead and did projected um, matings for uh, for the for Eileen's dream, what her in utero fall was going to look like from a six and seven generation pedigree standpoint. And of course, catalog style. So I would know what it would look like, hopefully, when we sell the Curlin baby at next year's Physic Tipton select sale. So that's arian.co.nz. All the kinds of pedigrees and reports that you would ever want. Catalog style, sixth generation, seventh generation, everything in between, theoretical matings. It's where I go to look up pedigrees. Welcome, everybody, for a special edition of Breakaway Rail Talk. Uh, this is a reciprocal edition. I had the, the opportunity to be on Billy Koch and Michelle Yu's uh, podcast last week. And uh, and the deal was that uh, that we had so much fun that we decided to spill over and have 2.0 podcast interview here. So I'm pleased to introduce to my new friends, Billy Koch and Michelle Yu. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank, Thank you, John. you. Hey, this is where Patty will put in applause, applause, applause. So that, like, oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> it'll, sound, it'll sound like there's cheering and everything like that. Yeah. It, it all goes back to your days of playing Northwestern baseball, right, Billy? Right. Do we have like introduction music? Like like walk up music, we do, we do as a oh, matter. Good. But the thing, all right, I got to say, I'm already, I'm already a little teensy bit disappointed already because last time when I was on your show, Michelle went on and on about how Billy, you and I look like brothers because we both had such great facial hair and everything like that, and I specifically shaved to look more like Michelle today. So that was <laughs> Three years. It took me three years to to grow that goatee and 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 facial hair. But for you, Michelle, I shaved. And I like it. Not a piece. I like it. It's you know, it's funny because I actually noticed it and just I was like, this doesn't look like the same guy. I thought maybe it was like your brother or something doing the pod today. This is not like to be offensive. You look like 15 years younger. So you and Billy are like father son now. I know. Thanks, Michelle. I know. That's like (laughs) you can always shave. I mean, we can have this this podcast you know sponsored by Dillette. My whole shaving thing is not a, a look. My whole shaving thing is just complete, Ease. complete laziness. Laziness. That's I get it. It is, it, it, the entire thing is laziness. I get it. I get it. Yeah. I, I, had a, I had a, 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 a shaving malfunction, which is why I had to go with the full erasure at that uh, point. Um, yeah, I got uh, a little too close to the electric razor. Wait, were you doing this and then you sneezed and like lost a whole sideburn? Yeah, basically, basically, you know. Oh, here we go. Hey, Spence, oh, how are you? Spencer's back. Yeah, this, is, this happens all the time. John, just Good get worry. used to that. It's all, axe, it's all that's fun. his axe throwing toy. He wants to throw axes right now. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Don't keep him out of the horse business. That's the most important. Yeah. Thing. So, so guys, I had so much fun. Uh, seriously, on your show, we talked about horse names. We talked about uh, what's going on with with the industry. That that I wanted to have you back on on our show, just to, so I can actually ask you some of these great questions that that you uh, spun towards me, and and hear more about what you guys see in the uh, going on in the industry, especially because you're primarily on the West Coast, and we're primarily an East Coast show. Um, so we constantly, we constantly disregard West Coast racing. And I know that it's prominent and it's important. And and aside from the fact that like every other trainer out in California gets gets a positive test for something. Easy. Easy. Go into that art. One out of every three. Okay. Every other, every other trainer? <laughs> Easy. I, I did want to start with asking you about What's going on in California racing and take your temperature about where you think it's going to be going in the next three to five years, because there's a lot of potential change going on. You know, obviously, um, for anybody who's who's watching Southern California, especially Southern California and even the north now, uh, obviously, they were supposed to get shut down. Now they're back. Um, we're in some trouble. Uh, there's no if, ands or buts about it. Uh, the question is how much trouble. You know, there's threats. You saw the threat, the, the threatening letter from Craig Fravel uh, from Santa Anita um, and the Stronic Group uh, about keeping Santa Anita open. If, if the North actually gets dates, we're shut, closing up and being sold. All that blah, 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 blah. We don't know what's true. The, here's the bottom line. The bottom line is for California to survive, we need some alternate form of revenue. 
Mm -hmm. And that's the truth because the purse levels continue to drop. And the, you know, you look at Kentucky where I'm sitting right now and and there's an allowance race on uh, that we just entered for 110,000. That same race at San Diego is, I think, in the 50s. Um, Something has to, something has to change. And unfortunately, we don't have historical horse racing. We do not have sports betting. We, we, you know, we are up against the Indians. It makes it very, very difficult um, for us to get that. And in order, I don't know where that's going to come from, John. What I will say on the positive side is there are a lot of people like myself and Michelle Yu that believe in Southern in California racing. We're very passionate about it. It is our home. We are not going to just let it go. Um, so, so I think, you know, for you, for, to give you a great prediction for the next three to five years, I honestly have no idea. I can tell you there'll be a lot of people that are going to work really hard to get some type of alternate revenue, uh, in there for the purses to be, to be more competitive and where that's going to come from. I wish I knew. How about that? That's, a, that's a great answer. It's a great answer. I mean, I'll, I'll pretty much ditto everything that, that Billy had to say. I, I will add one bit of maybe some clarity um, talking about the, the letter from first. I think what a lot of people don't realize is when they're only talking about like, are we canceling or not canceling Northern California racing? It isn't as simple as, Hey, we don't like the North Spencer. The big like behind the scenes of that is that money wagered on the north, even if it goes to the south. So if you live in San Francisco and you're betting a million dollars a day on Santa Anita, that money, your takeout money is not going to Santa Anita. It's going to the fun, to fund the north. Right. So um, first and, and Belinda have expressed multiple times over the last several years that there needs to be some kind of restructuring for that where it's a little bit more fair. You know, if, if there's a billionaire in Silicon Valley that's vetting hand over fist to Santa Anita and Santa Anita sees none of that revenue, that's really harmful for Santa Anita, especially with the purses, the the way they are. And we are overpaid in purses. So um, I think that that is a big component of this whole thing that 95% of people looking just think first hates horse racing. And that's not yeah. the case right. at all. So I think that no. they need to realize that, you know, what they want is it, is it to survive and all these people they're cheering on like the North getting days. Does the North understand that if all this, this is a trickle down effect. And if, if the North gets days that they can't support right now, and then nothing changes in the um, allotment of the takeout, and then something happens to San Anita, does the North understand that they are going away also? Yeah. Like the North and yeah. Delmar are not a circuit. Right. No. Right. No. Right. Yeah. Great, great points, Michelle. You're right. And, and, and I, listen, I, I know Belinda very well. I mean, I've been to Preakness. It's one of the greatest shows of, of, of the year. Uh, she Billy, obviously I'm going to preach this again this year. We get to have our dinner. Nice. Maybe we'll sorry, John. Outside, sorry. John could probably pay for it. You know, we always need sponsors. You need sponsors, absolutely. Um, well, no, well, but then you look at Preakness. You look at you look at what happened at Gulfstream with the Pegasus. Mm-hmm. You look at the new California event that's happening uh, pri- a month before Breeders' Cup. So obviously, you look at the the money they spent on the synthetic track at Santa right. Anita. So right. they're they're making investments. The the thing is. It, it just we just need a little help. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's a good point. They're bringing they're, they're making investments and they're trying new things like even sure. we, we took advantage of the fact that, you know, you had a Breeders' Cup out there and we sent four of our other horses out there um, to race that week because they were basically giving us a travel stipend and, and additional purse money, which right. I think, uh, you know, people took advantage of. Um, but wh- why is it why is it so hard to get horses into California, even when they had like a dedicated sale, um, you know, to, to have horses go out there? And I know a lot of the consigners in Florida were like, it's too much of a hassle. Um, but the money like the, like the populace the, is there. The money is there. People will spend mm-hmm. money on on horses and, and racing. So th- there's there's a disconnect somewhere. Well, it's hard to get to California. It's, it's, it's not a direct flight almost from anywhere, especially with the, you know, shutdown of a lot of the airlines and you're just FedExing your horses now. If you have to van instead, which a lot of us opt to van because we're talking about a huge price discrepancy, um, it's a long van ride. I mean, it's not that bad for you. You know, you're going to go to, uh, Kentucky to, to New York and you might be on the van 12 hours, but to go from here to there, you're talking three days. Um, so it's really cost prohibitive if you're going to fly and it's not exactly cheap to van and the haul is a really stressful on those horses so if you're thinking i'm going to come in for breeders cup well you know unless you're chip woolly you're probably not 
vanning from Florida to come over, especially if you're trying to bring an entire consignment of two-year-olds. You're not going to fly all those out there. So now you're sticking a bunch of two-year-olds on a van. How do you think they're going to look when they get out here a week before the sales and they're all sucked up from three days on the, on the ship? It's not right. easy. And I think that because California was such in the forefront as well of our veterinary regulations and everything, we are still one of the strictest, the strictest jurisdictions out there. A lot right. of people are hesitant to come out because they don't want to come out and then you know, they've been saying, oh, my horse is great. He's fine. He's hunky dory. And then we're like, oh, excuse me. Mm, that horse is not a hundred percent. And, you know, in order just to work here, you've got to pass three vet checks. So right. like there's no hiding something out here. And it, it is unfortunate in a way because not everybody is always a hundred percent. I know when I get out of bed in the morning, I look like crap, right? Like, I mean, I you bent over and stop it. I walk, you should see me in the morning. I walk no. and I'm like, oh boy. No. So um, I don't, you know, it's hard to expect a, an athlete to look a hundred percent every single time you pull him out of his stall and not even give him an opportunity to stretch or warm up. Um, so I, I do feel like that's harmful, but also a lot of people don't want to deal with it. You know, We've yeah, got owners that are from Kentucky and they come out yeah. here and they're like, it's hard to have a horse out here. You're talking about two different things. One, the sales that you mentioned, and it was expense. It was that they'd bring them out here. And un unlike other places, there's no one else to go once they're out here. Right. They 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 want to leave them out there. Right. So, right. you know, you're like, if you are an A horse, you end up just leaving them there. You don't get the money that you want. And it's just, it's an expensive to gum out there. As far as the other as far as racing out here. I do think, you know, I said this to someone the other day and and our new commissioner, Mike Rapoli, actually said something the other day about California that we need to help California, whether that's subsidized purses or, you know, he I know he has sent some horses out there personally. But it would be nice for some of these very large stables, whether it's Asmussen, Pletcher, Cox, Brown, right. there's no reason. I mean, there is a reason. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll tell you some of the reason, but there's no reason they couldn't have. A, a, a set of horses, maybe, you know, 20, 30 horses out in so in California. They they have enough horses. The problem is, and I remember this so well, and I've said this before, Michelle, you've heard me say this before. I was at a, a Barrett sale years ago with Todd Pletcher. I just happened to be at the bar with him. Todd Pletcher's never had a horse from us. He's always been very nice to us, though. He's always, you know, very friendly. And I said to him, I said, Todd, why don't you, you have a big stable. This is years ago. I mean, Barrett sale. OK, I said, you have a huge stable. Why not send some horses out here? He said, Billy, he said, if I send my B stock out mm -hmm. there, I'm going to get my ass kicked and yeah. I don't want to get my ass kicked. Right. So maybe there's a way. I, I don't know what that is, but but there, you know, we don't just want the B stock. Obviously, you have to send some A horses, but there's horses that fit. We have levels and we just need to help fill races. I can tell you, I can tell you, John that my biggest frustration right now isn't purse levels. Mm -hmm. That's not, this is me personally. Right. It's right. getting the races to go that you're mm -hmm. pointing your horse to because you want to run. I, for I example, horse. I've had a cow bred maiden special weight that could go dirt or turf sprinting. Race hasn't gone. He literally hasn't run in like, two and a half months we've entered it every time it's gotten up to like five in it they didn't use it with five and then they right. pulled three of the horses to fill the maiden calibre 50 and so now right. we're and just then, stuck and yeah. then we, you're not stuck you're not stuck but what happens is you don't get the race to run your, your trainer has a pattern right your trainer wants uh, is pointing to a race that's in a condition book and when that race doesn't go all of a sudden now it goes a week later okay you can still get your horse there it goes a week later okay but now all of a sudden your horse hasn't run for eight weeks right. instead right. of six weeks or four weeks or you know, whatever it is. And now yeah. you're kind of almost, oh, now he kind of needs the race. Now you wait for the next one and it's another six to eight weeks. You have no rhythm. And you that's that's one of my big, big issues. And I'm not putting blame on, you know, the, the race is here to Santa Anita. I think Jason Egan is, is a very good man who is working really hard and doing the best he can. And it probably not a great idea, not an ideal situation with right. a, a lack of horses that we have out there. It's frustrating. No, it's got to be. And, and and it makes his job harder. And, and people say, well, maybe, he, you know, the, not him, but maybe you, the racing secretary should do what they used to do, you know, years ago and actually go out to the barns and interview the trainers and find out, you know, what the stock is. And, and that should be the, you know. I think they do. 
I think they do. I think they do. I, 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 that's exactly what I was going to say. I think they when do. When was the last time you saw Jason walking around the barn? He I goes to Parker's Corner. I know. I, well, I have corner. complained to him multiple times and said, you should divvy up every trainer on the backside to someone right. in the race office and the race office like continuously checks into them. Like, how come you haven't run a uh, gray hat? Gray hat needs a race. What's the race gray hat needs? Right. But, you know, they, they can't pressure people into well, Michelle, running. I'm and, sure Ryan turns in a list every month or every any time the book's out, doesn't he? Why not? No. But that's on you. I turn in a list every two weeks to Jason saying, we call, where am I Ryan is on the phone with Jason like every single day. Like, I need this race. How, what's the likelihood of this race going? Like, right. I mean, I we talk to Jason I mean, all the time, yeah. but we've never been asked to turn in a complete list of our horses with you don't, you what don't conditions have to they be pick. asked. Why do you have to be asked? I would just do it. I do it. I, I don't. No one asked me. I just put it here. Well, I wish here's everyone, 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 everyone. We do it at the beginning when we get stall laps, but it'd be nice if everyone do did it. it because maybe we could have bigger. Right, but I think that's my point. Point. Do it. No one. You don't have to. No one get. You don't have to have an invitation. Right. right. Well, maybe Little Red Feather turning in their wish list of races has a lot more credence than Ryan Hansen turning in his <laughs> wish list of races. Are horses. Horses yeah, are horses. The racing office has many places to go, and they need them yeah. to go with the most number of horses yeah. possible. So, um, I mean, Michelle, you like you guys ran a couple of horses last week. You know, it was, it was the a worst day, day of like this is the worst weekend of racing we've ever had in our whole lives. Like, me, and Brandon, like me too. Me too. No. We yeah. ran eight last place finishes. Right. Yeah, that's every, worse. every right. single horse. Right. I mean, it's that never happened. Like that sounds if like my we Saratoga weekend. If Michelle. we had bet. That every horse would run last, like no one would have taken that bet. Like it was every single horse. It was wild. I've ne- I literally almost left work. I was so upset. Yeah, it's, it's, I ran it's, Michelle. We ran eight horses in in SoCal and had one second place finish. Yeah, but you didn't run eight lasts. No, we did not run eight lasts. No, no. <laughs> no but at that point, but but now on the flip side, so let, let, let's flip it around. Now, Billy, does that make it easier for you to sell? Little Red Feather horses because there aren't as many opportunities for people who in California who want to race. Uh, is that is that like a good sweet spot for you? You know, that's a tough question, but I, I would actually say no. I think when you have a thriving economy and you have a thriving um, um, uh, band of horses and, and, and you really have consistency and unfortunately the weather has taken a toll again this year, I think it it's hard for everybody. So no, I'm not going to say it's, it's definitely easier. And, and you know, we're at a point in in our lifetime that that we do have a, such a great group of little red feather kind of consistent partners that join us for a bunch of horses a year. But we're always look, looking for new people. We 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 want to expand our horizons. We're trying to do some stuff in other places in Kentucky, and we've had horses in New York. But our home, as I said before, is Southern California. And if everybody right. anybody thinks that's not going to be the case, they're dead wrong. I mean, we are going to continue to support Southern California continue to enter horses and continue to buy horses for Southern California. In the last, I think in the last three months, we bought like three, we bought three or four horses that haven't even run yet. Mm-hmm. Haven't had a chance to run yet. Got it. So it's been, it, that, that's why I think my frustration is there that you heard prior to, uh, to that comment. Sure. No, I, I, I told you. And, and right now, Little Red Feather has what, approximately 40 horses on their, on your current roster? Uh, yeah, I would say it's about 40. It's pretty low right now. Um, and then, uh, with another 30 pin hooks, we have a bunch that are um, being sold. We have 11 horses that are being sold at OBS April, uh, in the next few days, we've had some really nice works with, uh, Julie Davies and Tom McCrocklin. Uh, right. Tommy had a, was it Tis the Law one of yours? No, I wish she uh, was. Uh, was the, but, the Tis the uh, Law was like 20 and change. Yeah, yeah, she sizzled yesterday for Tom. So uh, kudos to him. He does a great job, and and so does Julie Davies. Um, so we'll, we'll have it. We'll be down there next week looking for another for some buys and 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 some sells, which is exciting. Yeah. It is. It's great to be on on both ends of the of of the equation, um, especially when things are thriving because there's just so many there's so many opportunities and so much excitement. Um, I was just on the on the phone with with the board at, at OBS, and and they're like they can't turn the calendar fast enough. They're so excited about what this oh, April yeah. sale is, is, is going to be. Michelle, do you ever get a chance to get to any of the, any of the yearling sales or two-year-old sales? Or, or are you? Yeah. Much- yes. I was at a uh, OBS. I think the last two years I did April. Um, I don't, we don't usually go to March. Ryan went to March at the last minute this year, but we, March is not normally a sale that we can afford. So April is kind of 
where we can go. And then I try and make it out for at least two days of Keeneland if uh, I can get childcare lined up. And then Ryan does go out for Keeneland. We don't usually do too much else. I've, occasionally, someone will want, you know, another right. OBS like later in the year, horse and Ryan will pop out for that. Yeah. I'll tell you that the June sale at OBS has really mm-hmm. upped their game. It's not just yep. the kind of the, the leftovers and the and the slowies. Um, it, it, it's really slowies. become the slowies. That's well, a, but that's, you know, we buy a lot of those at slowies. <laughs> no, we, we, I just we finished the broken, uh, bone sale. the broken bone sale. I don't like it. I just so finished it um, Severance. Did you, either of you watch Severance yes. on, on Apple yeah. Plus? Yeah. When you said slowies, I thought of innies and, and <laughs> I was like, that's good, John. That, that was clever. Clever. I, I want you know to make sure that's smart. I, <laughs> can I make a point though, John, because I want to say one thing about selling and buying at the same sale, please. Um, because I think it's really important because we sell under Solana beach sales. You know, everybody wants this, you know, transparency, transparency. We sell under Solana Beach Sales, just a different company. Most right. people know. And, and if anybody asked me if that's my horse, I would say absolutely yes. Sure. Um, but we don't. It's a major separation of church and state when we're talking about buying and selling. We do not buy our horses. That's right. period. Right. End of story. So if you we never did. had a horse. I just now like just like, you know, what happens if you have a horse that you just love and it went through and you're just like it happened. It's happened yeah, okay. twice in six years. And, okay. and one of them was actually Bobby Bow. Remember Bobby Bow? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. So sometimes it's like it's a circumstance where something crazy happens. The horse RNAs, you know, it didn't. It, what, that was a very crazy circumstance because he actually sold for uh, a million dollars and he ended up and getting then. returned. <laughs> so there, there was a whole big thing on that. We're not going to get into that. John didn't know that story, though. That's okay. No. We'll do that off the air. It's too long. <laughs> um, too it's too much of a long story. But then there's, but then there's, I think there was one other horse that for some reason, like either RNA and we just couldn't get a buyer and we're just like, all right, we'll just do it. But we're not, yeah. that is not our intention at all. It's right. happened twice. And I think, I think we've been pinhooking for six or eight years, maybe yeah. eight. No, yeah. this is pinhook eight. Yeah. Eight years. Right. Wow. So only two horses of about, you know, what are we doing? About 30 a year. So it doesn't wow. happen a lot. Wow. Yeah, yeah. no percentage wise. And, and and I'm glad you brought that up because the transparency, you know, issue is, is is so prevalent in our in our industry um, where, you know, it's unregulated. So you don't technically have to do it, but it's the right thing to do. And, and you guys have always been above board with that. There are there are other entities we won't get into um, that basically already own the horse that they're selling to their partners or, uh, mm-hmm. you know, or, or anything like that. And, 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 no, you know, no. honestly, in, in all my due diligence about Little Red Feather, I'm not just saying this because you're here. I've said it before. You, you guys are above board on everything. Well, I think you have to be. I mean, first of all, we have Gary Fenton. He's my business partner and he's a lawyer and he is just, you know, he's a, by a, the book. He's by the book. Like, you know, he doesn't like handshake deals. And so, I'm right. very fortunate because I would probably be doing a lot of handshake deals and saying, yeah, he said it was good. You know, that's just yeah. who I am. But um, right. Gary, is, you know, crosses the T's and dots the I's. And, and as a lawyer, he's very, um, uh, you know, unfazed by anything that has to do with, oh, the, we're just going to do it that way. He's like, no, 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 we're going to do it our way. So contracts constantly, right. um, you know, as much as we trust people, you still have to be, you still have to do it the right way. And we're representing other people. So if right. you're, you, you have to really be careful and you can't, you can't do anything that's not above board or else no one's going to, no one's going to come back to you. And that's what just, and plus we have right. to look in the mirror at, at night, you know, you got to well, look in the mirror and just say, Hey, I feel good about what we're doing. You know, we yep. get, we get ding just like a lot of partnerships with margins, like, okay, mm-hmm. but that's how we make money. So, right, exactly. you know, and but I love that people get upset about margins on horses, but like they don't mind going and buying a Ruka t-shirt for, you know, $35 that cost them $4 to make. Like right. I always say to people like you, everything you do has margins. Everything right. you buy has margins. These are our margins. If you don't like our margins, then right. you should go and get a bloodstock agent and fly to Ocala and yeah. vet all the horses and go find right. horses for yourself and pay right. instead of paying 10,000 for 10%, buy a hundred thousand dollar horse. Good luck. So I have dice. a question. Do you, when you're like, cause I know you guys don't buy like million dollar horses, right? You guys are no. super economy minded. I feel like. Or, me or John? Is, you. No, uh, sorry, Billy. Uh, sorry. Um, I, I, no, obviously John spends a lot more money than John, yeah, John, John does. John spends a lot of money on horses. Believe me, that's a whole other therapy session. So go ahead, do Michelle. you, do you um, think about what your margin is going to be before you buy it? So if you're like, we think this horse is worth 200, 
do you say like, okay, but we're going to, yeah. you know, or, you know, do we have to buy it for 150 to make sure it's still within that like affordability no. range or you're like, no, we, we think it's worth 200. Way. That's what we're buying it for. Our, our minimum partnership cost is probably somewhere between 50 and $75,000 per partnership. So if we're going to do a partnership of a horse, it's going to be in that 50 to $75,000 range. So if we buy a hundred thousand dollar horse, Normally, the margin is going to be, you know, we're going to sell that horse for 165, 175, somewhere in that, somewhere in that range. As we have to spend more, so if we have a horse for two that we're going to spend 250,000, that margin will increase slightly. It could be in the 80, 90, 100,000 for that horse because there's just much more risk at stake. So that we marginalize that that way. Right. And we do have a minimum. So if we bought a horse for 25,000, we still have to run the partnership for the three, four or five years and we still have to make money. So right. that's why we, we don't really buy horses in that range. And that because the partnership then for that twenty five thousand dollar horse might be 80. And then we're like, is that horse really worth 80? We bought it for twenty five. It's weird. It, that, it doesn't really work yeah. out that way. So that's kind of how we think about it. No, exactly. No, I think I think that makes sense. And, and you have to what people don't realize, especially ones that aren't in the business for, you know, for a very long time, is that they're paying for your expertise and your time. Right. So it, it, it's not like you're just going and, and throwing a dart against the board and saying, oh, I guess we're buying hip 82 because that's, that's it might be I'm better going. that way. It might be. I mean, for all of us, it might be better. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, right. John, John, that's a great point. That's a great point. And they're also paying for the ability to buy fractionally. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. They're, they're, we're, they're paying us. If you were interested in going in on a horse, a 5% share on a little red feather horse, you're paying me to go find that other 95%. Right. That's yeah. important. People don't yeah. think about that. Oh, yeah. So, plus the management of it all. I mean, good yeah. Good luck trying to get well, somebody. You're with, with you're like, I'd like to bid just on 10 percent of that horse, just on 10 percent. Right. You stand up in the middle and you're just like, I like this horse. Does anyone want a anyone? small yeah. piece? <laughs> <laughs> I told Ryan that when we were like bidding on a horse one time, I'm on the phone. He's like, oh, it's going to go up past me right now. Oh, it's just like one more bid. And I was like, J just ask around you. Do you see anyone you know that might want to go in? <laughs> go ahead. Can, can somebody please, yeah. can somebody please awesome. you know, like incredible. I will bid 100,001, you know, like just, <laughs> you know, just to be able to they'll, they'll look at you like, like they're cross-eyed. Um, so some of the people that, that I asked about you guys, I, I'm allowed to, to name names because they said very nice things. Taylor okay. Made had wonderful things to say about you both. Brett Jones from Airdrie, who is quickly becoming one of my Aww. favorite. Yeah, he's the best. Um, it, you know, it is, and we have a couple of mayors with them and everything like that. And and they were glowing about more more so Michelle than you, Billy. But I, I thought I, opposite, I, really. No. I get it. Um, and and Acacia is also a friend of the show and said that she really enjoyed doing the award ceremony with you, Michelle. Oh, she's great. Actually, I did a podcast with her this morning. Oh, really? Oh, nice. You, yeah, we did a no, we did a no, fantasy no. triple crown draft. Okay, mm. and 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 where was Hades? He was actually uh, Jonathan Kinchin picked him up in round five. All right, good round five. How many people? And he's were in the Lexington, there? right? Yeah, that's well. That was he's what he said. He was like, I mean, a yeah. horse that has to get points out of the Lexington. Like, I don't know right. how likely he is to win the Derby, but possibly that could be a really good Preakness play because it is throughout the triple crown. Oh, yeah. uh, that's right. It's a triple crown. Yes. Okay. So it's a triple crown pick. Okay. And that that's this year. And you guys will appreciate this because of everything going on in California with, with you know, well, not going on in California, everything going on with Baffert, who's in California, um, mm -hmm. is, you know, with his horses being pointed for the Preakness, um, it makes it so difficult for, for us to be able to like go, all right, well, we'll bring Hades into the Preakness. Not that the Derby is going to be easier or easy, I should say, mm -hmm. but it'd be easier than the Preakness. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what we're looking at. <laughs> Well, I don't know what happened to May Moon. Does anybody have any news on yeah, May Moon? Yeah, so May Moon, um, they said it was it was going to be too far for him, the nine furlongs in the Santa Ana Derby. So they are going to kind of recalibrate and uh, bring him back to shorter, keep him at shorter distances. Oh, like okay. the King's Bishop or something like that? Oh, uh, yeah, or the, or the, even the Pate Mile? Did they do that? Or? Pate Mile, maybe, too. Well, what, but, and, and there's no news on the other uh, Nisos. What's so Nisos, Nisos is for sure out. Um, he's going to miss the Preakness. He's still the at the track. And I saw May Moon jogging on the training track the other day. Um, so right. they're still at the track. They're just not in that heavy every seven-day so regimen that Baffer puts them through. 
So the big okay. bad Baffert is really Muth right now. He's the one that that kind of didn't get into the derby. I mean, unless you like imagination off the defeat, or I guess there's right. still, he's still got Coach Prime in the you know in the right. back of the barn somewhere. Right. Me up. Yeah. yeah, I mean he, he's got a tremendous you know lineup. It's, that's, oh, you that's, think? You know, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Newsflash. Newsflash. The, the sun came up and Baffert's got a lot of good horses, right? Yeah, exactly. Way to go, John. That's the way to add value to this. <laughs> Breaking news. How do, you, how do you guys handle... So I'm newer to this industry as far as the podcasting. I think you guys were like the patriarch and matriarch, respectively, of of, pot, of racing podcasting. How do you handle when you get these knuckleheads that, that are just outspoken on Twitter and 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 shit like that. Do you, I mean, Billy invites them on. That's the that's what <laughs> Patty and I were saying. Yeah. We're I, like, like, what's like what, which kind of knuckleheads, knuckleheads are you talking about though? Because there's 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 different kinds of knuckleheads. Normally, the knuckleheads we don't even pay attention to, or Michelle sure. writes them back and just Michelle can shut anybody up. I mean, she's <laughs> I'm I mean, way too nice, Michelle. You might uh, I just I think it's I think. Listen, I think you have to be really um, confident in what you do and the messages that you're sending out there and the positivity you have for the industry. And if that's the case, then it's just noise. And you let the people have their noise and and they can say what they want about you. uh, And and you just let it go and you keep working hard and doing what you're doing. I mean, you have a a really good stable of horses. You obviously have a nice, you know, nice show. You're buying, you know, big time mares out of these basic uh, uh, sale that I just saw. For six fifty, look at you. I mean, well, John, I want to know: is someone being mean to you, or yeah. are they saying bad things somewhere else? There are people that are being mean to me, Michelle. Uh, <laughs> they, they, Listen, haters gonna hate. Line, John. John, 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 just tag me in those, all right? Okay, all right, all right. Exactly. I'm gonna forward. I'm going to be on payroll very, very soon, think, Michelle. Yeah, no one comes after me because of Michelle. I think that's exactly <laughs> that's, why. No one comes after Billy because of Gary. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I, I always partner. wonder why partnerships end up lasting long. It's it's fear. It's strictly fear. <laughs> it's fear yeah. of blackmail. It's got to yeah. be. It's got to be right. Yeah. What what 100%. is? If you guys have been doing this for a long time on the on the podcast, what's like the stupidest question you've ever asked? Oh well, if you ask Mike Rapoli, um, the stupidest question I've ever asked is when you started like really getting into racing, like what kind of brought that about? And he goes, "Well, it wasn't the fact I sold my company for four point eight billion dollars, was it, dumb fuck?" That's basically what he said. And <laughs> sorry yeah, about the profanity. Well, that that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't uh, surprise and I was like, "Well, people start, you know, you could have started like with some cheap horses. It didn't have to be, you know, cumulatively because you sold your company for four point eight billion. So, so that wasn't a dumb question. That was a dumbass <laughs> answer. That was no matter what they asked them, the answer was going to be like I play pickleball, and this one instructor that 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 gives lessons every single time he's going to tell us how to do something. He goes, "So when I won the gold medal back in '92 in you know in this the, the St. Petersburg Open, I served and and that's like the way he starts every single thing. Mike's right. thing is well, you know, when I sold my first business for four billion dollars, you know, so don't that was not a dumb question at all. That was just directed at a. Annoying. I feel so much better. My face was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, no, don't please. I'll, I'll have you back on that one. I'll have you back on that one. Um, Other than is, that, we ask a lot of dumb questions. Well, yeah, we, don't we don't. So. Yeah, my whole thing is that I don't even research people. So sometimes I'll ask something, and Michelle will text me like, "It's like, um, you know, his, his, you know, his his wife died last week." Right, right, exactly. You might want to. Yeah, like, <laughs> hey, you know, I don't know, something stupid. Well, that's why I was so impressed that, like, you said, "Hey, I went on this new thing called the internet and looked up a couple of things about John," yeah, and I was like so cool. honored. Yeah, I do that five minutes before we come on, just so I know. <laughs> Sometimes I'll send Billy like a link to an article. I'm like, here, read this yeah. and get a question out of it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Nice. Nice. Sometimes, to be fair, Billy doesn't even know who the guest is going to be. That's 100 percent true. <laughs> it, I think to be fair, and and th- I like the spontaneity, and I think it brings something to when you talk to people and you really don't know a lot about them. And and right. our show is very you know owner centric i mean michelle gets mad when we don't get owners on she gets pissed at me like we have a special episode with a vet or a trainer um you know carrie brogdon who's an owner is coming on our show actually this week to talk about obs and to talk about sales and she's been on before she's great um but we do ask if we're not talking about something specific like obs april um we're usually talking about the same kind of thing We're, we're learning about that ownership journey 
and, and right. what has the excitement and the path and and what took you here. So it's a pretty standard type show. It's not like we're all over the place and we have to think of, of a zillion things to ask. We're not breaking news, right? That's not our, right. although Billy tries to get like fresh two-year-olds or he certainly tries to get like next really? spots for horses. What yeah. do you mean? Like, you're like, tell me if you have any good horses coming up. Oh yeah. 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 I like to, yeah, like, like, you know, like to babies, yeah. or like, you know, he'll be like, what's the next spot for, uh, you know, this horse or that horse. So he yeah. certainly has oh, asked yes. like, those questions. I like before. a little gambling edge at that. Yeah, like yeah, but, but we're not trying to break thing. any news, right? We're just trying no. to spread people's stories like that. Right. That way it's not Bob Baffert's May moon, right? It's, Right. You yeah. know, Amr Zidane's May Moon, and we all know about Amr because he was on our show. Like, I right. mean, that's what we were trying for, right? That's well, that's I'll, actually I'll... how we started the show. That was my pitch to Michelle a long time ago, as I used to get uh, like upset when it would say, you know, uh, Phil D'Amato's Stronghold. And yeah. I'd be like, Phil doesn't own that horse. It's Rick right. and it's, it's the Wallers, you know, and it's yeah. I, that would frustrate me that owners never did get a chance to tell their stories about their horses. Right. That, that bothered right. me. Yeah. So, so much so that like, I just, I went on a little Twitter rant yesterday with, with a knucklehead. Um, about, oh, you did? I'm going to find it. Why aren't yeah. there any owners in, there's not even an owner's wing in the, in the hall of fame. There's really, I didn't know that there, there's a, there's a trainer's wing. Yeah. There's a jockey's wing. There's a horse wing, but there were not any own. There's no owners oh. on the, on the ballot this year. And I was like, well, wait a second. Why aren't there any owners on the ballot? And somebody said, because they're called, there's something called pillars of racing and the pillars of racing. If you look it up over the 200 year history of the, of, of the horse industry that they cover, there's 41 people in the pillars of the industry. And unless you're named Hancock clay um, right. Phipps or, or something or something like that, um, you ain't in one of the pillars and there hasn't been a pillar. Like Cod Campbell was the most recent, you know, person in our industry. Wow who's represented as a pillar of the industry. So it kills me that the owners, I mean, again, I'm an owner, but it kills me yeah. that owners aren't in there. And somebody said to me, well, part of the reason why owners aren't in there is because they don't add, they don't add anything to the performance of a horse. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I I'm went, sure some know, owners, would, some hurt. owners might, some owners just like sit there and maybe just twiddle their thumbs and say, here's my money and do what you want. But I'm but sure just as many owners have something to do with, think, you know, finding out that horse is going to be good and sending him to the person that could develop him the most. And right, I mean, that's right. crazy. I mean, that's I mean, really, I like, you're, you're, go ahead, the whole John. value, no, the whole value of, of what you're adding as a managing partner is all your experience and all, and all the decisions. Like I know you're on the phone with the trainers, you're on the phone with the jockey agents, you're Absolutely. on the phone with the, with the racing offices trying to figure out who's going to be, you know, where you're, you're proactively I giving. Think most trainers wouldn't like it, John. I, I, th I think most trainers, and Michelle, correct, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I think trainers would like the owners to buy them the horses and mm -hmm. then just shut up and get out of the way. And yep. Get out of the way. Let me do yep. my thing. And mm -hmm. I, uh, and honestly, I think that that would make them very happy. They wouldn't yep. have to talk to owners and everything like that. I think it's a pain in their ass. But at the same time, John, I th I, I think you're right. I mean, I, like a couple of names just thought it popped into my mind, like Eugene Klein. Like, is he right. a pillar? Like, should he? Shouldn't he be in the hall? Like, I'm just like all these great California, you know, Elmendorf Farm. Like, Elmendorf the, Farm. shouldn't yeah. shouldn't they be in the hall of fame? WT yeah. Young, you know, from right. from Overbrook. Yes. I mean, there's yes. there's, a, there's a bunch of people who who aren't you know, aren't five generation Kentuckians right. that need to right. be considered. I'm not saying me, like I'm not. Well, this, this yeah, I mean, argument. John, the Horonises have to eventually be a pillar of racing, yeah. right? Well, I think so. Absolutely. Why call them a pillar? Just call them what they are. They're, they're like an you know, influencer in the industry. Yeah. They're an owner or a breeder. Sorry, your kids Absolutely. are there on the cursing, but. That's oh, my kid, no, my, you, my you, job you, is to get my kids, kids first word to be the F word just to piss off my mother-in-law. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. <laughs> The typical, but it blew my mind that there wasn't there that there wasn't even an owner or a breeder for that matter on this year's ballot. That's yeah, that's strange. I would have never guessed that. I would have thought there was owners and breeders. You you huh. would you would hope so, right? Because why yeah. else why else would we do this? Like like you know you do well, this. I mean, you, you, wanna... you talk about you talk about legacy, legacy, um, mm -hmm. like in any sport. Legacy is something that you think about, but you don't necessarily plan for. I, I, obviously, you want to leave a lasting legacy. You want at the end of the day, when you're done and I'm retired and all of us are, you know, 80, 90, I'll, I, you guys will probably both outlive me. But 
the you want people to say, hey, that Billy Koch, you know, really did good stuff for horse racing. I mean, it should be that simple, right? He did right. he did this, this, this. He really helped. He was president of Karma. Blah 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 blah. But like, that's hard to think. You're not thinking about that as you go. You're kind of. You're, I'm more. Th- Sometimes I think about relevance, and I always want to be relevant in in the current situation. I want people to know, you know, that name, Little Red Feather, means something. You know, um, right. we take great pride in what we do, and the horses we buy, and the people we work with, and of course our partners. Um, we think they're the best in the business. They are so supportive, and we have bad shit happen all the time, just like everybody else. Um, and it sucks, and we hate it. And I feel so badly when it does happen. But um, this game is, as Michelle and I say on every podcast, John, this game is so hard. Um, yeah. So you know, enjoy those high moments because they're few and far between. And so take advantage of those situations and enjoy it. And then you know, when you have things that go wrong. You know, you're going to be sad. You're going to be bummed. You're going to just, right. you're going to want to just, I do the thing. I try to keep a very, as a, as a managing partner and, and as someone who's responsible for a lot of people, a lot of different owners and a lot of partners, I try to really keep a, a, a happy face and, and make sure, listen, you know, it's not the end of the world. And then I get in my car and like slam my head on the screaming, the steering wheel and scream mm-hmm. like five times. Like that's yep. like my, like, oh, you know, yep. but um, that's me. I yep. get it. You have to have that outlet one way or the other. Right. Right. You, you got to do something. I just yell at my kids. It makes me feel so much Sometimes better. I've called Michelle. I've called Michelle in the past and said, like, did you see that race? Like, am I wrong yeah. to think that something that was right. not good? You know? Yeah. Well, it's it's good that you have a sounding board in each other. And it's good that you guys use the term brutally honest um, in, in the last show. And Michelle, as a as a special present for you, a gift for being on the show. We have reserved the name Brutally Honest. And unless Billy wants to use it for one of his no, horses, I'm going to use it. Horse that honest. is going to be named Brutally Honest. What a I great love. name. Yeah, we, we actually, believe it or not, we, we had a horse, we had a filly named Brutally Honest years and years and years ago. She was a storm bird and she was a fucking lunatic. I mean, like a typical storm bird, just like and and the reason why we named her brutally honest is because you know I, I would call my trainer and say, Hey, how's the Stormbird yearling doing? Well, to be brutally honest with you, she's a fucking nightmare. Or to be brutally honest, like so we ended up naming her brutally honest. And you know what? Nobody's used the name since. So I reserved it after our last That's conversation. Amazing. And That's Michelle, awesome. you will have the honor of of being able to name a horse brutally honest and know that it's it's because of you. No matter what anyone else says, it's because of you. Very cool. John, is this the least you've ever talked in a podcast, by the way? I feel like Billy and I just like talk the whole time. And sometimes you're like, awesome. <laughs> no, this is awesome. This is this is like the best because it, it, and again, you guys have had guests on, you know, where you've been like, sure. OK, this isn't a deposition. This is an interview. Like, you know, yeah. when I ask you what time it is there, do you know what time it is? You don't say yes. You give me, you know, tell me what, what's and, and it's like pulling teeth and I won't, you know, we know what we're talking about. But I and, and it's like, oh, for the love of God, just please you know, put five words together. So no, this yeah. is fantastic for me to be. And I know Patty's very excited about the fact that this is the least amount of, of conversation I've added to, a, <laughs> to an interview before, which is great as far as, as far as she's concerned. Billy, uh, last question for you is yep. when you go to a sale and you really like a horse and you're like, I love this horse, you know, it's, it's across the board. Everyone, everyone thinks it's good. Mating wise, it's good. Breeding wise, it's good. And uh, genetics, it, it, it breezed well. You know, and it's just going to be a little bit more than I think what we can we can pull together. Do you find that it's better to like let the investors know ahead of time, hey, this is what I think we're going to have to spend on the horse? Or are you buying the horse on spec and then going to get investors at that point? Buying the horse on spec and going to get investors. But we have to be really careful because if we price ourselves out, it's not good. We know what our investors like to spend on horses. So um, my theory is there's always another horse. Um, I will put my head down. I will, I'll be there. Um, that's what I always tell people too, when they're buying, you know, or they're buying one of our horses. Hey, just be there. I don't know what the horse is going to bring. I can tell you that we're going to make our reserve very reasonable just to kind of get it going. Um, Um, I don't, I, I'm, I've kind of changed my pattern lately on finding out reserves. I really don't like to anymore. I used to be a big reserve guy and know that mm-hmm. the reserve was 99 and try to be a hundred. Um, I, 
I don't want to do that anymore. I just go in and I kind of think what I want to spend or what we want to spend, I should say. And right. if it goes, you know, there's always a little, oh, God, I really want this. Can we do it an extra couple of bids? Sure. But then there's a point where you just go, hey, it wasn't meant to be. And you just move on. Yeah. Well, and, and you've earned that. You you know what the currency should be as far as what these horses should sell for. And and if it's way above that, then it's not it wasn't meant to be anyway. Sure. So so when do you partner up with people? Is it is it that you've landed on the same horse and you don't want to run we, each other up or you need the very, extra? Very rarely do we partner up with people on sales horses. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, I think it's only happened a couple of times because um, when you do it, actually are the margins get affected. So right. if we buy, like what we talked about when we first started the show, if, if let's say there was a horse for 200,000 and you and I split it, John, right. so it was a hundred each. And then right. I had to put on my margin, making it, let's call it 75. So it was 175 for our 50%. Well, I just turned that $200,000 horse into a $350,000 horse, right? Right. Right. on on paper right and right. and yeah. that's that doesn't that's unattractive whereas if i just bought the whole horse for 200 and charged 300 it's yeah. actually they're buying the same horse for less so on those sales horses it's very difficult for us to partner up most of the th- time when you see us partner partner it's we bought um we bought a horse and the o- original owner wanted to stay in for a leg or Got something it. like that um Got it. or Got it. um uh we do a um this thing called the airdrie partnership you brought up brett jones mm-hmm. so for the last um couple of years we've done an airdrie partnership where brett basically has four yearlings sometimes they're rnas of his sometimes they're horses he bought and then we take a third and madiket takes a third and airdrie keeps a third and that's how we mm-hmm. got conclude actually. Right. Um, so, so those are, when you see that it's just being creative, but usually on sales horses, John, we, we don't have partners. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Well then, well then I'm going to shift my, 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 I know I said that was my last question, but I just thought yeah. another one. So I'm going to, um, so I'll, <laughs> I'll shift my last question then instead yeah. of saying, Hey, we should sit down and, and figure out, uh, if we can buy a horse together instead, it should be, Hey, when we're down in Ocala, you and I need to sit down and make sure we're not bidding against each other on, on, on the top <laughs> horse of your list and my list, because me, there's no sense exactly. in making other people more money. You know, that, that's probably more money. beneficial. It's probably not only that, but you have a lot more money than we do, John. So I'm, I don't think you should be worried about us. Nah, I don't know about that. You know what, though, Billy? Like what you said, what you said before about you don't ask about reserves anymore. I, I used to be the same way. Like I would ask reserves, ask reserves. And what I found is that not only, um, you know, does, does that number change? Apparently, you know, like yeah. like when uh, after okay. after it's not just us, I'm sure like after big guns like you guys, once you ask a certain consigner what the reserve is and you go, oh, OK, they'll run back to the office and, and up it because they know that you're interested. Right. And I just Here's don't what you guys do. You guys have have me and Ryan ask for what the reserves are. OK, yeah, right. <laughs> because yeah, well. then they tell us they're like, you Look, I would advise people and the, the, you you almost hit it on the you, you kind of hit it on the head, John. To be honest, if there's uh, brutally honest, if there's a horse we're interested in, I don't want the consigner knowing we're yeah, interested in that horse because exactly. they, they know they know what kind of horses we buy. They know our right. range. So yeah. even if yep. and, and there's no law about someone sitting in the back of the ring bidding for themselves, they can bid themselves. Right. There's no law yeah. around it. So if yeah. they happen to see us bidding and they know I'm now it's risky, but they can do right. it. But I don't right. want anyone knowing what horses we're on. I'm very quiet. I don't want my name yep. on the vetting sheets. I want nothing. Yep. I want to go in there and try to buy the horse. Yep. Well, the only time that your name is on the vet sheets and stuff is because I actually use your name as a pseudo name. So that way they don't know <laughs> it's me. Right. I, put, I put Little Red Feather. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to start doing that, too. <laughs> you guys should all Billy do it. Has a lot of horses today. Know, what the hell is Billy doing? He's <laughs> Except when I get the bills. I, it'll be like, <laughs> right here. <laughs> exactly. Then we can we can we can dole it out accordingly. Yeah. So now, Michelle, it sounds like I'm hiring you not only as my muscle, but also to <laughs> throw people off the scent. Yes. As far yes. As, okay. The decoy. All right. All right. So as a decoy. So are you the available decoy. for the April sale? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I can maybe make that happen to come out and just be a decoy. Yeah. OK. Get, All her, right, just, get her room at the WEC Center and she'll be fine. You oh know, my gosh! They the wouldn't even center. let me in. They run your credit when you get to the door, and they're like, "Sorry, oh, man, the, uh, the Motel Six is down the street." Oh, wow. So I can tell you, the last time the, when I went to the Wex Center for the March sale, it was the second time I'd ever been there, and I was like, "This does not belong in Ocala. This is like way crazy, yeah. right?" And yeah. I'm walking in from dinner, and I'm I'm old school. Like I'm just as happy at the end of the day to go to Jersey Mike's and get a sub. 
you know, than to have to like entertain. Right. And, and I know Billy, you have to do that, but like, I just like to be able to go and, and kind of just <laughs> relax and, and deflate. I walked in the, I walked in the hotel at eight o'clock and there was a fist fight going on between Ooh. two prominent Kentucky trainers um, oh, in, the, in the right outside of right outside of that bar. And I was like, it, something Did you never start throwing about. down bets on who was going to win? I wish I was that savvy. I was just, I was so shocked to be like, really? This guy's got a horse in the Kentucky Derby. Well, now I'm giving it away. This guy's got a yeah. horse in the Kentucky Derby and he's throwing down because he's drunk at eight o'clock at night. It, it's, and, and yet these are the guys that are, that we're picking, having us you know, pick horses for us or, yeah. or yeah, but just horses. because you could, maybe you could pick a horse and pick a fight just the same. That's all right. I, I never judge people on their, you know, other things like just if right. they can train a horse or they treat a horse right or they're nice yeah. to me like doesn't mean i'll hate you and if you right. you know get into fist fights for fun you gotta have a little decorum though don't, don't you think i mean you, you, think? Should, you should you should but like I mean, also it's Michelle, not like the rule they're, 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 they're telling you they're, they're telling you that it's a credit issue to get into the hotel when in reality <laughs> they wanna... probably ran like a criminal check on you uh, Maybe, possibly. I do right, want to tell you guys this, though. I, I saw this note that I think is very important if you guys are staying at the WEC. Um, yeah. the, the the room windows are not uh, tinted. So if you are naked and watching yeah. the horses jumping, the yes. jumping people can see you standing naked. Uh, I'm staying at the other I'm saying it. There the was like world. a whole, there was like a whole uh, TikTok thing where people were like, yeah. "Who are these people?" And they're like riding and they're filming, and these guys are like watching them and they're just naked. Wow. You know what? That explains why a bunch of them were looking up in my room and laughing, and I'm yeah. like, well, you know, as I as I as I'm like drying off, and you know, now I get it. It all. Yeah, so it now all, you get it. All made and now just keep your bum to the window. Yeah. Well, that, at least they can see that. That's you know that that's acceptable. That's that's all right. <laughs> Oh man! All right. Are there any anything else that we that are that that was out of bounds that now is in bounds that we want to talk about? <laughs> I think we've kind of we talked about everything. Show. I would like to know. Um, I'd like to know your derby pick right now. Gun, gun to your head. Gun to my head. I I, I got to think it's going to be uh, Sierra Leone. I really I was okay. really impressed with the way that he runs. And yeah. the only thing I'll say is that there's not a lot of speed out of the projected horses there's not a lot of speed in the top in the top 20 right now so he well, may know fears is gonna have to go now. because he can't win if he's not on the lead right i know yeah. well that's the thing like you know he's he's he, and i said this on the on the podcast i don't i think they edited it out but i'll say it here um where the horse is exactly just like the owner the, the owner is very brave and very robust and, and proud of himself until somebody eyeballs them and then it's like oh yeah. well no you know it, so, Michelle, the fact that you eyeballed him and called called out his bluff and he had to be like, oh, I'm right, I'm right now, you know, that's it, it, it's just like his homebred. We'll see if that makes it. We'll see if Patty lets me put that one into this. podcast, yeah, Especially with Spencer playing with trucks in the background. John, thank you very much for having us on, though. We appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you. Wait, you can't. This is my podcast. You don't end it. Oh, this is, sorry. This is my I my show. It. I, I wanted to know. For, I'm going to rip throw that right back at you. Yeah. What what who do you think is going to win the derby? Gun to your head. Yeah, no, you know what? Um, I really was impressed with Sierra Leone. Also, I was at Keeneland on Saturday, and he was just awesome. I mean, he covers so much ground. I think if you're humble looking brag. for another horse. Humble brag. What do you mean? What was the humble brag? <laughs> that I was at Keeneland? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I saw him on TV. I was at Keeneland this Saturday. There was your free bottle of bourbon, Michelle. The truth is, I saw him in the paddock, and then I left to beat the traffic. I did not watch the TV. So there's right, your humble that's, bag. That's true. That's, um, that's true. Uh, I think Chasing Freedom, people will forget about his big move that he made, too. I think he's an interesting one. I think the horse that finished second to Sierra Leone for Brad Cox. Oh, um, the Justify? Yeah. Yeah, I thought that horse ran really well, and he's he got a lot of experience that day. I will be against fierceness. Just I won't at a short price, knowing that right. he needs so much to go right, I'll be against him. That's where I'm at right now. Very fair. Michelle? Uh, in my fantasy draft, I picked Sierra Leone first round. I'm oh, not wow. really in love wow. with anybody this year. I, and I don't like the fact that he is a, a cold closer because I really yeah. prefer a horse that can be more forwardly placed. Um, but I just don't, I mean, 
I fears is going to go out there and give it his all. And if he's on a lone lead, he'll look really good turning for home. Um, yep. But if anybody just random looks him in the eye, then I don't know what's going to happen. My yeah. heart also says stronghold. stronghold. I, I think the Wallers are great people. I, I'm they obviously wonderful. The motto. Yep. Uh, he's my yep. main trainer. He's I'm really guy. proud yeah. of the, exactly. the job that yep. he's done. And I think that horse is very, a little bit underrated. I haven't seen all the numbers. Um, right. I've seen that horse train. He trains like a, he and he trains like a really, really good horse that he is. Uh, obviously, won the Sandy Derby and and he was impressive and he had trouble and and he he's a cool little dude. He's not not the biggest horse in the world, but he's he's pretty right. cool and he, and he nothing bugs him. I think he can handle a big crowd and at you know you're probably going to get what twenty to one, eighteen to one on, yeah. on that horse much. Like you that. think? Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm unloading. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he'll, listen be, to he'll, you. Be, he'll be he'll nice. be fifteen to one or higher for sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that yeah. sentiment. Now, all, all all bets are off though. If Hades gets in, then then I have to change yeah, my answer to Hades. But you know that, that, that goes without go that, that goes without saying. I don't why I'm going to get more haters on the. the you don't even pick you're, no, you're you running your horse no, to the no, ring, or you didn't even pick him for the Derby. It's like whoa, you're good right. to the to the five people that listen to to me, right? <laughs> um, well, listen, Billy Koch and Michelle, you, I can't thank you both enough for being on on the podcast. I've enjoyed our conversation so much. I hope to continue this on for not only for uh, on air, but off air, because I do really enjoy Same. your insight and your humor. And and now, Michelle, I got a job for you. So it'll be, yep. it'll be you know, you'll be on payroll as well. But I, I also wanted to sincerely thank you guys both because you guys were pioneers in setting up, you know, thoroughbred related podcasts. Not a lot of people, if anybody was doing it, certainly not at the level that you guys have done. And and you paved the way for the rest of us and, and you made it a lot easier for the rest of us. So, uh, you know, we, we patterned ourselves after the Owner's Box podcast and you guys have had a good 10 year oh, run and I so wish you another sweet. 10 years. Thank you very Thank much. You. That's all Billy. It was all Billy's brainchild. Was uh, if if it wasn't for Michelle, there would be no pod. That's right. Thank Killing you. it. You're killing it. But but thank, thank you, you both. both very much. And good luck at the upcoming sales and, and uh, upcoming racing. Um, and uh, we look forward to more conversations with you. Thank you.